Hey everybody, my name is Michael Rosso. Welcome to the Film Photography Podcast, the podcast about, well, film. I'm here with Mr. Matt Marash. Hey, how's it going, everybody? And Mr. John Fidelli. Hi, how are you? Uh, this is a show? Yeah, on today's show, we're going to be talking about 4x5 X-ray film. We're going to be we're going to be talking about D96 Black and White Developer. Hmm. We're going to be talking about my hashtag and many other people's hashtag for 2020 and beyond, Hashtag shoot box speed. Uh, we're going to be talking about stopping the stop bath. Stop the stop! Large format Friday, the series. That's Matt's new series on YouTube. We're going to be talking about that a little bit. A phenomenon has happened. Um, FPP supporters have come out of the woodwork and are now supporting the film photography uh, project by giving a small monthly donation to the FPP to keep, keep us running. Oh, really? Yes. <laughs> wow, that's great. Yes, it started last month with... Uh, 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 <laughs> Jeremy North. Thank you. It started last month with Jeremy North, and it continues. And I am so grateful because uh, I think of these folks as essentially their associate producers. Yeah. They're sure. producing the show. What show? And I just said to John over a bagel that uh, the contributions have now have now enabled the FPP to, uh, you know, the next time we do a group get together or the school donation program and people have to travel and stay at a hotel, um, it won't That'll bankrupt help. me personally. <laughs> 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 so I am grateful. The, the most recent is uh, David Talay. I want to thank you very much, David. Right. I hope I'm pronouncing your name right. And people who donate, I send an email out right away. So if any of you folks have any comments for the FPP, just send it on over. Mm-hmm. Uh, gentleman Travis Pate, he says, Thanks, Mike. I've been a listener for years, and I can't possibly quantify how much you and the gang have helped me out. I'm glad I can now return the favor. Keep promoting the F." PPPs, those are the Film Photography Project philanthropists that are contributing. I never noticed the monthly donation function until you called it out on the last episode. I'm sure there are plenty more folks like me who would just need to be informed. That would be great. Like, if you don't say it, no one's going to know, Matt. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you got to mention it. Uh, Ken Bertram Photography. Thanks, Ken. If a button exists and nobody pushes it, does that button really exist? Mm, that's yeah. right, yeah. Oh. Brian yeah. Walworth. Thanks, Brian. Dixon, our good yeah. friend Dixon, who is constantly sending us cameras for our school donation program. Dixon will go online to Goodwill, find a bunch of Nikons or Canons, wow. and then order them, have them shipped right here. Dixon's the best. Thank you, Thanks, Dixon. Dixon. Uh, Paul Wagner. Yes. Oh, Paul, yeah. Oh, okay. You know Paul? Yeah, uh, Columbus guy. Yeah. Why don't you read this one, John? I've also been meaning to tell you, and was prompted again by your most recent podcast, how much I appreciate your leaving politics out of it. I get so (laughs) tired of people that can't put two sentences together without getting in a political dig of some sort. They give you the impression that they don't even want to be in the same room with you unless you believe exactly as they do. I blame social media in the large part for this, as people can just put things out there without having to engage in real-life conversations with someone and hear their side of the story. I did appreciate your and John's comments that our leaders, and especially our president, are working hard from a very difficult hot seat to help our people in our country. Well, that seat's hot, all right. It's a hot one. (laughs) Hell yeah. If people give you grief about that comment, poo-poo on them, as John would say. Do I say poo-poo? No, I don't think so. Uh, best wishes, stay healthy, and keep up the great work. Hope to meet you and your team in person at a future meetup. Yes, that would be great, Paul. be great to see any humans. <laughs> not that you're not a good human, Paul, but I'm just saying it would yeah. be great to engage with some people who are like-minded. And so, uh, last few shout-outs, shout Pat Lynch. Uh, Pat Lynch! Our good friend Tim Anderson. Tim Anderson! Yeah, here, read this from Tim. Tim. Thanks again for all the fun and inspiration. I might be eagerly awaiting the Negative Supply Co. 120 film carrier. Mm. I have their 35 millimeter version and has pretty much retired my Nikon LS50 for 35. 
I can tear through a roll of 36 exposures in about five minutes, making 61 MP images from my Sony AZ-RIV. There's a lot of numbers and oh, models, A7R4. numbers yeah, and yeah, stuff. Yeah. It says 7RIV. Oh, 4. 4, yep. For people who are smart. Negative Lab Pro for Lightroom finishes them off with negatives to positive conversions. It also makes scanning fun. <laughs> Almost. <laughs> Scanning's not that fun, is it? No. No. Okay. I, all right. I think that camera scanning is the future even for labs as the old mini lab scanners begin to break down. Anyway, no chance. I'll stop shooting film. Tim. Thank you, Tim. Thank you for, for being Thank an you, FPPP Tim. super subscriber. Uh, negative supply. I guess we'll in the future we'll talk about that, Matt, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's it's kind of ongoing. It's It's been on the market. Uh, I've used it quite a bit. We use it at Midwest Photo. It's, yeah, solid. Uh, Not rock. And then uh, Mr. Ryan Long, thank you very much for being a super subscriber. He says, thank you and everyone at the FPP for keeping film thriving and for hosting a show what show that's what he says oh that is a lot of fun your discussion of the nikon f4 a few years back inspired me to buy one yeah they're nice it's been truly fab camera your dedication to listeners and to the students who benefit from your equipment and film donating program is inspiring ryan long thank you You like the f4 right mike I never shot with it. Okay. I know you're a Canon guy. So I have an AE1. <laughs> so, you, know. you have a lot of AE1s. I do. And I don't Too want to uh, neglect. Um, this is our uh, second uh, big show using video, Matt. We received a lot of messages on this new thing called YouTube. <laughs> And people commented, and I'm very grateful that there's some interaction. People are commenting. What do people have to say, John? Uh, love the show. Keep these shows coming. That's from Angel Roca. Chris Ayudo says, I really enjoy watching when you make videos. Going to make a broadcast desk for Mike out of Argus C3's Game of <laughs> Thrones style. AAG244 says, hurrah, can't wait for live shows. Miguel Lopes says, do you think the pandemic and pro prolonged lockdowns may deal the death blow to film photography? Let's ask, let's ask Matt really fast. Yeah. What do you think, Matt? No, I don't think. I have never seen more new people getting into home darkroom than right now because mm. small labs, like their local labs, aren't doing anything right now. Um, I'm personally not doing any processing for midwest right now so people are they've got a little extra time maybe not a little bit of extra money but a little bit of extra time and they're they're experimenting they already have the stuff this is just kind of forcing their hand kind of like we already have we have the stuff at the studio right we're, we're doing this so it's kind of the same thing mm -hmm. well, and John. speaking of developing yes uh eugene batiste says you can definitely mix half a pack of d76 just weigh it on a scale okay hold a second we talked about that so Yes, technically, you could take your D76 powder black and white developer and using a scale, you could evenly break it up so you could mix a half a gallon. But Matt, let's ask Matt. Matt. Is it, can you take your D76 and cut it in half and mix hmm. half a gallon? Can sure, you? but what are you going to do with like the leftover powder? <laughs> Why? What happens? It oxidizes? It's going to oxidize pretty rapidly, so you're going to have to... You, I would recommend, if you're going to do that, double bag it. Get, like, a gallon freezer bag and, you know, put one in and then, uh, that like, put it in a smaller sandwich bag and then put it in that gallon freezer bag if you're going to try that. <laughs> really keep the oxygen out. Leslie felt that the mixture of powders in that packet, that you would not be able to evenly distribute it if you split it in half. What are your thoughts on that? It's It's pretty difficult to to guarantee that it's going to be good. I, I always just mix the whole bag, even if I don't plan on using it. The, the life is, is pretty good on, on D76, D96. Uh, when I have a powder, unless, uh, unless it's an isolated powder, I will, I'll mix up the entire thing. So yeah, Leslie is correct. There's no way to guarantee exactly. You know, it's all white little, little specks uh, when you open the bag. So right. yeah. As I, as I always say, do what makes you happy. <laughs> as long as nobody else is getting hurt that's yeah, what... don't, don't go out selling little dime bags of d76 mm -hmm. that, that's all right okay. what else john <clears throat> um where was it 
Hey, Jack Klugman and Tony Randall. Walter Matthew and Jack Lemon, the odd couple. I've just watched up to the part when you say about, so what are you going to talk about in this session? I'm definitely coming back to watch the rest. But I'm stuck in Portugal on my own with five cameras and about four Russian lenses with adapters for my M4 slash 3 Olympus. My Russian feds are home in the UK. Uh, but laugh, you brightened my day and had me laughing more than I had for months. Thanks so much. I'm 70 and grew up with this dry jointed at the hip humor. You love him. You hate him. The boxes, the setup, the side profile of the year, medium <laughs> format, 60 millimeter, black and white. Aye, aye, aye. So funny. All this is, is caused by UFOs. <laughs> Thanks. That was uh, from FL Remand Chief. And who's the other guy? Who's the guy that, that you didn't like? Uh, that oh, I didn't okay. like. You mean I didn't like? Metal Dog says, I was enjoying this until your compadre playing the ridiculous sound effects every 20 seconds, uh, seconds started to really great, especially as he had almost nothing but inane comments to make. One, two, three, forget about it. K-14. C-41. Boston Luna Pro F. One, two, three, forget about it. I think he thinks I'm putting on the sound effects. Because the name comments oh. can only refer to Marnie. <laughs> um, I'll check out the FPP, but you'll have to change this pathetic format and use the time to discuss film rather than fill it up with, frankly, childish behavior. What do you think, Matt? Sounds like a comment from, like, 2012, doesn't it? Cheers. I feel like they might not have seen the previous 248 episodes. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're right. I think uh. you're right. Love this, guys. Good work. You guys got the social distancing down. Thanks for doing this. A lot of other good uh, comments. Great. Um, Thanks, everybody. Very, very thankful to uh, what I would call very constructive comments. And Matt, you recently resuscitated your YouTube channel, which is Matt Mirage, Matt with one T. And how you've been doing a, a large format Friday going over step-by-step step of how to use a large format camera. How has the response been and how have the comments been? The response has been overly positive, which is great. There's, I, I don't think I've had any trolls yet. You know, you get the, the, like the bot comments as soon as you upload something, like the just generic great content, whatever. But it's, it's been really good. And I, I had a hunch when I started piecing together the videos and trying to figure out what I wanted to do there's got to be more than just Michael Rosso that have a four by five camera and like are scared to use it. So <laughs> <laughs> I, I kind of banked on that. You know, the videos are for the Michael Rosso circuit 2012 who have that four by five where they bought that intrepid and they're like, I, I just need to get out there and, and get the confidence with it. So if you can, you know, go through one video two video and say, Oh no, this is, this is easy to do. I can I can get this going. So I, I see a lot of folks that are grateful that there's something out there that they can rely on for reference. Like, I'm not going to pretend like there's no other reference material. There's plenty of good stuff that's already out there, but I'm trying to lay this out as a complete step-by-step. -step. So really make your way through what are going to be the first 10 episodes, and you're going to be pretty primed to, to shoot. You'll have all the basics down. And as we go on further, there'll be more advanced little things that we can uh, get going. But uh, response has been great, some good interactions, and I always get a question or two on each video that reminds me, you know, kind of grounds you and says, oh, you really can't assume anything when you, uh, when you set up something that's tutorial-wise. It's kind of like the, did you ever do in grade school the, the test where they... they uh, they tell you you're supposed to write out the instructions to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. No. <laughs> and, and then you have to like follow it to a T. So like you say, get out the bread, spread the peanut butter on the bread. Well, if you say, if you don't specify, you have to spread the peanut butter on this side and the jelly on that side. Somebody might make it like an inverted sandwich, kind of kind of like that. You're trying to describe to uh, someone who isn't, who's never seen a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, how to do it. You almost kind of have to outline things like that. It's, it's, it's interesting. Have you received any feedback yet from people who have watched the series and have actually gone out there yet? I have a couple of FPP listeners, uh, Aussie, uh, Aussie Pete. 
He oh, commented on some of the videos. Uh, I think he's getting out there, getting ready to shoot. And um, one of our FPPP, uh, you know, super contributors, uh, Paul Wagner, I know he's getting back out there and shooting. He's getting his camera ready. He's been sending me some emails um, at MPEX. So we, we've been back and forth. So I think some folks are, are actually getting out there and doing something with it, which is that's all I want to see. Absolutely. Uh, the most recent, uh, one of the mo more recent episodes you talk about uh, doing the dance, which I find hilar hilarious. The dance is basically getting out, setting, you know, you have to go through the process of setting up a tripod, right. putting your camera on the tripod, uh, do, you know, doing the, the battery of tests before you're actually ready to shoot. And uh, I, rem I remember that dance well. And, you know, once <clears throat> you do the dance, um, then it's like riding a bicycle. I mean, still, yeah. still make a few errors, of course, uh, you know, or if you're rusty and haven't done it, but um, it's really not as hard as it looks. It's not as hard as a TikTok dance. <laughs> nope. <laughs> so, um, so I think it's a great series. It's on Matt Marash's YouTube channel. I mm -hmm. mean, even if you're not yet shooting large format photography, it's a good primer. It really is. It's great. Um, and uh, it, it doesn't matter if you're shooting um, four by five, eight by ten, or larger. It's it's huh. it applies to all of it. Um, so that's that's really awesome. Can I ask a question? Yeah, Matt, what are you shooting these days? Are you shooting outside in your yard, your dogs? Yeah, that, kind of all of the above. I'm I'm just out in the yard. Uh, the good the good thing is we have a uh, a nice little outbuilding that doubles doubles the the floor space of the uh, of the downstairs area so i can go out there and experiment and mm. trying to clean that up and turn it into a more of a legit studio but i can leave it's nice having a place i can just walk out and like leave it a mess that isn't the house yeah that's great <laughs> that, that's the best part oh good well now's the time to clean it up got plenty of time yeah i'm trying <laughs> hey matt thanks for sending me that picture of your dog with fresh mouth Oh, Zill? Yeah, here. Hey, what? Uh, Who's that she mean? is. What's fresh mouth? Fresh mouth. So fresh mouth used to, for me at least, apply to a cat. So you'll see your cat, right? And your cat will like just go sniff something, be like sniff, and then when the cat reveals its face to you, <laughs> <laughs> why is that fresh mouth? Because it looks like it's fresh. Like, oh. you know, like fresh, like minty fresh. No, not fresh, fresh, like as in slapping fresh. Like oh, okay. fresh. It looks like, oh. you know, and I've seen it so many times. And then so many years ago, I mentioned that to Lauren. And she's like, oh, Strula gets fresh mouth. <laughs> gets it all the time. <laughs> fresh mouth. Okay. So we're talking about large format. Let's, let's talk about uh, something relatively new uh, here at the FPP. Uh, which we brought back, if you recall, uh, Matt and folks out there, uh, years ago, and for many years, we offered 4x5 x-ray film. And what I would do, and I have to tell you, I, I hated it. I, I don't hate very many things. But at the time, 8x10 x-ray film was available, so I used to have to take the film into the dark room. And thank goodness I could use a, a, a safety red light I used to have to cut the film to four by five by hand. Wow. Oh my God. And it just, it's just not fun. It's drudgery. Yes. Uh, and it went away because I, it just became too labor intensive. And that's the thing, you know, people often ask us for, you know, special films like, Hey, can you get, you know, roll six sixteen film, one sixteen film. And a lot of times it's accessible. I can get the film, but the process of doing it, of rolling each roll by hand, uh, would take up every minute of my time. So mm. for a few years, we stopped selling x-ray film. We received many requests for it. And lo and behold, when I, when I started thinking, oh, we should start carrying x-ray film again, I noticed that other than amazingly large sheets, it's not... I mean, I'm sure somewhere in the world, but here in the U.S., the 8x10 dried up. Yeah, it's, it's drying up everywhere. Yeah. And that's because, I mean, it's my dentist's fault, your dentist's fault, your doctor's fault. No, I'm serious. One day I went into my dentist's office, 
And lo and behold, they're, they're you know. It was all digital. Yes. Their x-ray machine was, they were bragging about their new dig- digital technology. And I was just right. like, oh, really? So that happened all over the country here in the U.S. And I guess the demand for x-ray film has just become so much smaller. It's very niche, yeah. That when I went to purchase the 8x10, uh, it was gone. It was just it wasn't available. So I did a lot of research and I found um, some 4x5 x-ray film pre-cut, pre-boxed, uh, 25 sheets per box. It's cheaper than buying standard black and white film. Wow. Um, so Matt, what are your, what are your, for people shooting four by five, what are your thoughts on the FPP x-ray film? I've been, so I, you know, of course I was a tester on it. So I, I got the first like experimental sheets and then, well, you know, once, once everything was in the 25 sheet boxes, uh, thanks for sending me that box over. I, I shot everything. I went outside. I did some landscape stuff prior to the lockdown. I, I did some studio tests played with natural light, uh, hot lights, LED lights, you know, all sorts of situations. And it's, it's a really nice x-ray film. It's a, uh, I would say this is more of a traditional um, or what's called half speed blue film. So x-ray can have a few different like speeds essentially. And the speeds are all based on what type of light they're sensitive to. You've got your, so most x-ray films are orthochromatic. They don't see red light. I don't know of any that are panchromatic, but then there's some see blue and green, which are usually the higher speed films, the full speed blue or green. Then your blue films are usually a little bit slower because they only see blue light and ultraviolet light. Mm-hmm. And then there's your half speed, which those are your higher resolution uh, films. Since this is a four by five film, a lot of time they have to have it be a higher res film than maybe the larger stuff because they can spread up, you know, spread more surface area around. So this is like an ISO 5 um, blue speed film. And the look of it is, it's pretty cool. It's kind of like you're loading really, really, like you're using films that are very similar to what would have happened around the turn of the turn of the 20th century. So it's pretty neat. For, for people just starting out with 4x5, what, what's, what's the benefits of, what, I mean, overall, what are the benefits of using an X-ray film over a standard panchromatic Ilford or Kodak film? So I think it's it's higher resolution than trying to do like paper negatives, which is cool. You can still enlarge it. You can still scan it quite a bit better than you could a paper negative. But the other nice thing is like using paper, it's orthochromatic. So you can have a weak red safe light in the dark room and you can kind of do everything by inspection. You get to see the process. Oh, here's how I load the holder. So the way I used x-ray film um, you know, slightly, uh, slightly before FPP started carrying it was I just learned the ropes. So I got all my mistakes out of the way on film that was much less expensive. And when something's less expensive, of course, you don't have that that worry, that emotional connection. Mm-hmm. Oh, gosh, this costs so much. Why am I going to, you know, <coughs> wait, waste it on this? So now you're you're kind of free to experiment, play around. Um, there's, you know, there's downsides to x-ray film, but I think the advantages outweigh the... Um, the, the risks, I guess, with shooting it. And for learning, it's excellent because you get to see everything. Right. You get, to, you get to really analyze your process. And once you've got that, then you're not worried. And then a $4 piece of film isn't as scary if you if you practice on a 50 cent sheet of film, you know? Mm. Right. So folks listening at home, if you're shooting four by five, we do now have the, the return of x-ray film and we'll we'll keep it here as long as people want it. It's as really as simple as that. We have a nice large batch of it. We'll have it for, definitely for the next uh, six to twelve months. And if it's popular enough, we will continue to you know we'll continue to bring it in. And these days, um, you know, um, I research these things the same way with initially with the six twenty film. We're bringing any special film in. Uh, it's an investment and it's something that I believe in and, um, everything we've always brought in, Matt, doesn't matter what the film was. Um, I've always believed in it and people have always tried it. So I have a lot of confidence. Uh, I never ever think that I won't be able to get rid of it. Like we won't bring something new and be like, get stuck with it. It's never happened. Even 
even back in the Impossible Project days. <laughs> no, that became a collector's item overnight. Exactly, exactly. Oh, even the debonairs? Debonairs are still consistently selling. Wow. Yeah. Okay. And it's it's the debonair camera. It's a hundred. It's a one twenty roll film camera, like a Holga, but a little different. Plastic um, lens. Oh yes, very plastic. It still is the best kept secret at twenty bucks. I mean, where where can you get a camera, medium format plastic camera for twenty bucks? The FPP you can't. The other secret is we carry Holgas now, and it's it's like. Probably the most unpopular item in the store. Huh. It's ten. There's so much other stuff. It's ten, well, it's ten dollars cheaper than anywhere else on the planet. Doesn't matter. It's just wow. kind of just there, and no one really notices it. Well, it's we got to talk about it more. There's that great shot, shot with the debonair of Matt, with uh, who's the famous photographer? Oh, uh, Andy Leibovitz. Yeah. Oh. Professor Jeff shot that. Yes. Yeah. So here's Matt with Andy Leibovitz. You know, a great shot, by the way, shot with the debonair, hmm. which is, I find, hilarious. That was great. That was such a cool night. I brought my debonair and I brought my, uh, my SX-70. Um, okay, so we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, I'm, I'm very excited about our breaks now, Matt, that we're video. Because I'm a film collector, a uh, motion picture film collector. So some of these famous Kodak spots... I have the 16 millimeter film and I'm able to roll in some actual commercials. That's pretty neat. Yes. And I'm really thrilled. I have to tell you, I was looking on some collector forums and on eBay for commercial spots. I mean, I spent a good hour, two hours, just like I found spots. I'm like, oh, this is great. This one. <laughs> wow. Don't have it yet. But soon, John. For Car- Carter's pills. <laughs> Why? It's like a nineteen early nineteen sixties ad. It's like a guy in a doctor's suit, you know, holding it up. It's like Carter's pills. Is he smoking? It's not smoking. No. But there are commercials where, like, a doctor recommends cigarettes. Yeah, camels. There were camels. I think so, or yeah. Viceroy or something. So you know, we're at least. I feel like I bring a lot of pop culture, mid 20th century, Mad Men era pop culture mm-hmm. to the FPP. You do. And uh, it is good. So I'm looking forward to bring some commercial spots. So okay. I don't know. Let's see what we have on tap here. And we'll, we'll be right back. Okay. <laughs> hey, Doris, look what we won. Some family. Catch dirt. <laughs> I know I should pre so but I can't always. Answer? Punch detergent. It puts the enzyme power of pre-soaks right in your washer. Watch. We've stitched around stains and dirt. Let's wash in punch. Now, remove the stitching. It's clean. The whole wash is. Listen to Sheila. When you can't always pre-soak, punch. <laughs> hey, we're back. I'll tell you what I like. What do you like? Coffee. Nothing like a great cup of black coffee. Oh, yeah, I got my coffee right here. It's warm. You know what I notice? Thermos. I notice about podcasts, there's the wets and the dries. Mm, That's right, yeah. (laughs) Oh, people who drink and don't drink? Yeah, like we're a coffee podcast. (laughs) Yeah. And other podcasts are like booze podcasts. Oh. There's... (laughs) How do I join the booze podcast? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> we'll do that now. It, it's like the light bulb went on over my head that we carry so many films, hand-rolled FPP films, that have origins in, you know, they're, they're movie films. And that of all the, the developers we're carrying, that we should be carrying D96. Hmm. Because if you look at Eastman X. You will see that it says develop in D96. Uh, the Orwo black and white films, which currently, as of this recording, the FPP branded films 100, 400 are Orwo, UN54, Orwo, N74. They're nice films, by the way, Matt. Oh, yeah. The Orwo is great. Yeah, they're beautiful films. Uh, the uh, low ISO uh, black and white film 
is uh, got a dog there. Oh, so yeah, Strudel just. Oh, Strudel. Mm-hmm. Hi, hi, Strudel. Hello. <laughs> oh, isn't he cute? Yeah, he's all fat and happy. He just ate food. He just had a Scooby snack. <laughs> he did. <laughs> Does he have to go make a is. Scooby poop outside now? <laughs> <laughs> so D96, it's new. It's not a new developer. It's new to the FPP. We sell a powder that mixes. <laughs> we sell a powder that mixes one gallon. Uh, and uh, according to Leslie, you could shoot. You could like develop like fifty rolls from that gallon. Yikes! You get a lot of mileage out of. We're going to be doing a few different segments on D ninety six this year. One Leslie's going to head up. But Matt, what is your? I want to get your take on it. What is your take on D ninety six? Yeah, great. It's just a, another good option that's out there for folks. That's uh, you know, it's a bit of a a softer developer. So I feel like with these lower speed films that FPP offers, the double X, um, the the FPP X-ray film, that's what I've been using it mostly with. Anything that builds up contrast really, really quickly, this stuff just softens it right out. It's great. So, Mm -hmm. uh, and you can use it as stock. You can kind of treat it like like you would D76 so you can dilute it um, as a one shot, like one to one if you want. I haven't tried it one to three. I'm sure there's some formulas out there for that, but um, I use the massive dev chart as like a good reference. It's it's solid stuff. I've um, I don't think I've I'm even through my first gallon yet. So I think I've right. thrown a, a whole box of twenty five sheets of X ray at it, and a few rolls of I did some T Max in it, and I did what else did I do in it? I think I did some Pan F. So the uh, the Ilford fifty speed that turned out really smooth too. Do you see D ninety six as being like a go to now for some for certain films that you're developing? Um, I've, you know, I haven't changed a lot of my stuff in, uh, once I kind of fell into my, my thing with doing the pyro developers and such, I still use that as my primary, but if I'm just like in a hurry, I want to do like one roll of film and I don't want to like get the whole setup going. The, the D96 is, uh, is great to use. I actually did a video for, uh, for Midwest cause I was testing out the lab box. I was showing people how to use it and I just used D96 because it's what I had on hand and it was great. I did uh, what, what film was that? Oh, it was uh, it was FPP double X. Oh, so nice. I had, a, I had a roll of double X. I souped it through there. I used it as a use it as stock and it was super fast and like the the contrast was really nice and sm- it looked like a normal you know panchromatic film even though it's typically kind of punchy if I use like a standard developer or an HC 110. So it was awesome. What is your, your, I mean, for what you're doing on a daily basis, what are your, I don't know, top three go-to developers these days? Um, the Pyro, so the PyroCAD HD that I mix up myself. Um, I, I do that, and then I'll have D76, or no, HC110, and then D76. So pretty pretty Kodak-centric as far as uh, the mixed stuff. Um, HC-110 is what I use at work when I do black and white film for uh, you know other people's stuff. And what's great about that is it's you get so much mileage out of a bottle of the, you know, what used to be syrup, now it's just like normal liquid, which is still kind of right. weird to get used to. But that stuff's great. And I think D96 um, is probably going to take over that spot that D76 had before because I feel like sometimes d76 can be like too punchy because i'm used to like overexposing my film from using the um the pyro so much so i think d96 could easily take that spot uh, just be a little bit more versatile for people trying out funky films well good uh so thanks we're going to be hearing more about d96 if anyone has any questions about anything we're discussing here you could uh email us podcast at (laughs) filmphotographyproject.com (laughs) <laughs> okay so i try not to post anything on public media on social media that is um personal 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 I'm sarcastic oh. i try to avoid it there's just no reason for it uh because even though i think my humor is somewhat sarcastic i try to be 
as very even as possible. However, I have posted a few times hashtag shoot box speed. All this is, is caused by UFOs. <laughs> on threads where people are talking about, you know, taking a 400 ISO film and pushing it to 6400, 6400 ISO. So for folks uh, watching or listening, uh, shoot box speed. Matt, maybe you could shed some light here. What is the fascination and reason, if any, to not just shoot the film as it's prescribed on the box and as far as the ISO that you're shooting it at? Yeah, I, I think it's people seeing really neat results out of photographers they're inspired by and they just, you know, they pick it up, maybe haven't used it before and then they're baffled when they can't get the same result, you know, and it's... Mm. It's a factor of not knowing the the materials maybe as well or or there is there's it's it's easy to make a mistake when you're new. It's even easier when you make it harder on yourself by, you know, grossly under or overexposing and not changing other parts of the process. So I think it's a it's an understanding thing and a an experience thing. Oh, Strudel's getting fresh mouth as I speak. See he's angry about it too. Shoot at box speed, folks. Well, it seems it seems it seems people are posting like almost like they feel it's like a badge of honor to boast that you shot it at such a high ISO. What is that all about? Yeah, I think it's just maybe a, a comfort level with shooting digital in the same way because you know digital like mm. I think one of my mirrorless cameras shoots at like ISO twelve thousand or something. It's like and it's no problem. It br- doesn't break a sweat. So. You're used to materials, go, you know, getting pushed that far, and maybe you just want to do that with your own, uh, with film. And there's nothing wrong with going outside of box speed, but I think if you're new to it, shoot a lot of it and don't budge from that box speed until you know that the results that you're getting are, are the results that you know you wanted, or you can you can control it, right? So, you know, is your cam- are the shutter speeds accurate in your camera? Is there light leaks? So you got to weed that stuff out first and then then go from there if you're new to it you know it's cool to do little ones and twos by roll of this by a roll of that but once you've got something you, you've got okay results with buy a lot of it get you know get a dozen rolls of it and really really start to know it then when you experiment you're going to get even better results because you're confident at okay this is a 400 speed film i know exactly what it's going to do at 400 now let's play around. What if I do it at 100? What if I do multiple speeds in the same role? How's that going to look? Is it going to mm. be better for scanning, worse? So I think, I think it's just a, everybody wants that, like, you want to be just as good as the person you saw instantly, right? And you want to get there as fast as possible. And so they see a cool result and they say, oh, 1600. I can, yeah, no problem. Just follow this step, that step. And then they get the result and they're like, ah. Uh, I, I see it all the time processing other folks' black and white film. I think I actually do process more rolls of HP5 at 1600 than I do at, at 400 at box speed, which is, is kind of crazy because that's a lot of extra time just sitting there, and do, 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 you know, agitating the film and waiting for it. Are people shooting uh, HP5 at 1600? 1600 or 6400? Uh, 16. Oh, 1600. Is is a note coming in with the film that it was shot at sixteen hundred, or do- a lot of them will mark it? So Ilford on the canisters, there's little boxes now. So there's like a four hundred box, an eight hundred box, a sixteen hundred box, and a thirty two hundred box, and they just check the box on the film. Hmm. So I think people, I think also they'll just think, oh, just check the box. That's what it's at, and maybe didn't set the meter on their camera. So there's you know, there's so many fact. It's just like the the chemistry thing. There's so many factors. You got to isolate them. You have any questions, John? Yeah, I do. <laughs> uh, is there a push and pull on the box speed for any camera or any film, rather? A lot of films will give you some latitude for push and pull, but only I think some of the the most modern stuff is going to have little boxes on there. Ilford's been great about it. I think a lot of black and white films have that versatility, but on the color films, I think that's all up to the lab and the form. Mm-hmm. Because most color films get uh, you know the same time and temp unless otherwise specified, mm-hmm. where black and white's very custom. You know this roll gets this time, so um, I think it's doable. But then there's, you know, I haven't shot. Jeez, 
I'm trying to think the last time I, I shoot box speed when I use D96, when I use D76, but as soon as I use pyro, everything actually for me gets cut in half. I have to pull everything, everything I have to overexpose and, and then uh, develop at like my quote unquote normal time. So mm. if you don't know what that normal time is or like the ins and outs of your camera, it can get really, you're just kind of shooting in the dark. Yeah. So, so you, if oh, wait you, a minute, I got another question. Okay, come on. Uh, you you were talking about multiple uh, speeds on the same roll. You can do that. I mean, you can, but you're gonna you basically. Would you do that? Mm, I would, if those if those other speeds were lower speeds. So essentially, pulling the roll, you could be fu- you'll be fine because like you can always print through a really really thick negative. Um, scanning is going to suck for that. But if you if you start a roll at 400 and you go inside and all of a sudden you're at 3200, you're mm-hmm. going to have one of two things. You're going to have burnt to a crisp uh, stuff at 400 if you push process it or just like super thin, not going anywhere uh, stuff at 3200. So if you go if you go higher on the ISO, weird stuff can happen. But if you happen, you know, if you're starting at 400 and you go outside and it's a day for 100, shoot it at 100. Mm. It'll be fine. Like film can handle so much overexposure, but that underexposure is really where it starts to kick in. And if you're developing the film yourself, you would basically need to compensate the development num- the number of minutes developed based upon the change in the ISO. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Okay. And so if you're if you're taking your ISO and you're lowering your ISO, you're effectively giving the film more light. You typically want to reduce that development time. That's known as a pull. And then extending that development time is a push. And this is really the same. If you're used to working with digital pictures and you have those little like exposure sliders in Photoshop, what you're kind of doing when you push that exposure slider to the plus is kind of like when you're pushing and when you go to the minus, it's when you're like pulling. But it also, because film already has kind of a curve to it, you're also changing that contrast when you do that too. So uh, pushing is always going to make your stuff a little contrastier and pulling is going to reduce that contrast a little bit. Very interesting. Now, if you're not developing your own film and you're sending it to a lab, do you need to have somewhat of a relationship with your lab in order to sort of inform them of how you shot this? And if you do, sh- shooting, let's say, 1600 of a 400 ISO black and white film, are you spending more money? Oh, that's a great question. Well, I'll start because I am one of the guys at Midwest that does the black and white processing. I have never once been annoyed that somebody told me how they shot their film i would love to know how you shot your film because that helps me get you the best result possible you know the more information i have to work with the better but um you want to i I, yeah i love hearing that information coming from how the how the role was shot and it it definitely informs the the processing on it um i i recommend yeah, starting starting with a roll at at box speed. See see how the results look because um, unless you ask, some labs don't even let you know what developer they're using, or you know how they right do stuff. right. So I I've again I never hate having that conversation. I love hearing that somebody's engaged enough that they want to know. Maybe they want to learn the process. So uh, I never feel like that's um, that's a bad thing. It's it's great to have that kind of relationship know how they're handling it it's kind of like um you know learning a little bit more about um, any process or where your food comes from or anything i mean it's not like we're we're there at the the dining table asking you know what the chicken's name was but we want to know a little bit more information <laughs> get the, 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 the chicken's name yeah probably not <laughs> well excellent so your recommendation my takeaway from mr matt mirage is that If you're new to film photography, shoot at box speed until you kind of get a grip on what you're doing, how it looks, and you're happy. And then if you want to experiment from there, go for it. Go for it. Shoot a bunch of that film, though. Like, shooting one roll of film will tell you that you got lucky, you know? Like, results from one roll of film tells you you got lucky. Two tells you, okay, you're getting a little bit better with this. And rolls after that 
show your mastery of that, you know, of that specific product and your tools. And, and like, if you're testing, like if you're testing out a camera, this is not a good time to throw a new expensive or experimental film. Like the FPP, um, the color infrared, right? Oh yes. It's, it's a special treat to have that type of film. It's very, very little is available. Why risk it throwing that in the camera that you don't know what the result's going to be? You're probably going to do it in one that you know is good. Shutter speeds are good. Light seals are good. And you can get a pretty controllable result. And then after that, yeah, start messing around. Go for it. So that's, that's my take. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Matt. That makes good sense. <laughs> we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to be talking about some stuff. If you are not already taking lots of indoor pictures... Why not get started this week? Tomorrow, get some flash bulbs and several rolls of Kodak film. Save your fun in pictures, cause fun's more fun when you do. Remember, your surest way to better pictures is to insist on the name Kodak. Hey, we're back. Uh, a quick letter from Bill Donovan. Mr. Bill Donovan, uh, I met. And I think Matt, you met when at the last FPP walking workshop in Finlay, Ohio, back in 2018. Uh, Bill says, "I want to drop you a note, let you know that I really enjoyed the video version of the podcast. It was great. Keep up the good work. Hope to see more of them in the future." So, I really am basing this whole video thing <laughs> on <laughs> on your feedback, folks listening, fo- folks watching of whether you like this or not. I sent this email also to you, Matt. Uh, There's a gentleman, uh, Jaya. He is a, a world in isolation.com. It's uh, an international photography project, whereas you can go to a world in isolation.com and sort of like share images of what's going on in the world mm-hmm. regarding, I know a lot of film photographers have been documenting what the world is like. Certainly if you live in New York City, the the view from your you know, the view through your camera of a street in New York City is certainly very different than it was mm-hmm. just six months ago. Uh I don't know. Perhaps there are a bunch of filmmakers out there shooting their uh, their own twenty eight days later because you could you could run through the streets of every major city and there's no one there. Yeah. It's uh frightening. It's <laughs> just frightening. It is. I had to drive my wife to the city a week or so ago, and it's usually about a 40-minute ride with traffic in to Times Square. I got there, dropped her off, and came home in 45 minutes. There was nobody on the streets. It was just super weird. Yeah. And of course, Matt, myself, and John, we were there in October for the big Photo District News show, yeah. and uh, it seems like it, like it was another world. So it was. we're all just like you folks at home. We're all kind of just waiting and seeing what's what's in store mm-hmm. for all of us. Another month, another thirty days, we'll know what's happening. Yeah, we'll see for the next uh, thirty days. Uh, last show that we did, John, you and I, we received a letter from uh, Bradley Bull, and mm-hmm. Bradley's talking about CPF filters, circular polarizer filters. Never heard of the guy. Um, and then a uh, good friend, Doug Golubsky chimed in talking about using, uh, polarizing filters. Uh, the question that Brad has was that if you used a pol- a circular polarizing filter, would it affect the effect of using Lomography purple film? Huh? And our thought is that it would not because Lomography purple film doesn't need additional filtration to get that, you know, a faux infrared look yeah now matt do you use polarized filters at all oh yeah um anytime i'm doing something uh outside i use it a landscape a lot you know like rocks trees water anytime so when i do like digital classes water windows and sky anytime those three are involved you probably want to have a polarizer on there Uh, if you're inside it's really just needlessly taking a stop and a half of light away and if you're using super wide angle lenses, it can be weird because you get that crisscross, that uh, that little yeah. V in the sky, because you're you're polarizing an angle that the the lens is seeing wider than. But it's 
it's definitely a good tool to have in your kit. And I think everybody can benefit from them if you plan on shooting outside. Right. And do you recommend a, the circular ones? Uh, f- so f- circular polarizers, uh, I, had, I had to like fi- figure out the difference for this a few years ago because I started getting asked this question a lot more. Circular polarizers are really only uh, going to be beneficial for cameras that are doing like uh, in-camera metering on there. So for like, they're optimized for like your digital cameras and digital sensors that are reading TTL and through the lens. But if you're shooting like film and you're metering kind of manually, you can use just like those linear polarizing filters that go on there. Um, and you can also get a pair of linear filters and crisscross them yourself and get some weird neutral density type effects. But um, I like circular polarizers because they're convenient. They're on there. You twist it. If it looks good through the lens, you're, you're a okay. You're good to go. But they can get expensive if you're putting really big vintage lenses on there. You know, once that size of the filter passes 77, it's like, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So what's the difference between a circular and a regular polarizer? Is it just that you can adjust where the area of polarization is? Yeah, you're just adjusting that angle and it's Uh, already kind of on that ring. Yep. Yep. Gotcha. I owned a Koken brand. Koken. They were big. Yep, fit into my uh, Koken adapter, and you could circulatize it and, you know, use it any way you want. So, Can I read a couple more comments from what? the last show? Where? Right here, from the oh, YouTube. Okay, great. Uh, Fabrico Jimenez says, this video is the highlight of my day, so good to see you guys well and healthy. Please do it more often. Greetings from Costa Rica. Cheers. Uh, I love this, says Ganzonami. <laughs> your, that's what it says. Your audio quality is great, so that's encouraging. Oh. Well, we're going through, we're jumping through a few hoops to get the audio, and the quality image is great. nice as well. So there you go. Uh, people have been pleased with the image, and uh, okay, great. That's about yeah. That's it for the comments. Though. And it says, <laughs> uh, "FL Remandig." says the Italians started singing and thanking, et cetera, from the windows. Have oh. you seen that phenomenon? Did we talk about we that? We talked about, you know, how at 7.30, 8 o'clock, people cheer for our, uh, our workers, hospital, our, health our workers, workers and hospital delivery staff. folks and all those Do you do people. that in Columbus? Um, I don't know. I don't go out that much. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, that gentleman said that basically, hey, look, this start in, started in Italy. It did. Mm, that's right. Well, that's yeah. weird. Hit the fan yeah. first, so. So we have one last topic before the Zoom software kicks us off because we don't have enough sponsors to... Uh, <laughs> Not yet. Peep this rolling. Smash that button. <laughs> stop bath. Okay. Stop. Now, stop bath. Now, so bath. John and I going to college, we had stop bath in the uh, university dark room. Mm-hmm. But since... Getting back into developing film, probably taking my lead from from you guys, like Leslie and everyone else, I just never bothered using stop bath. I used water stop when developing my film. And when I, you know, use hashtag stop the stop bath, some people are, you know, everyone does it their own way. And I don't want to discourage people from doing things their own way, but... The question, and I pose this to Matt because, Matt, you're always in the darkroom. You're de- oh, developing all your own film. Is a st- So you have your developer. St- some way you have to stop the developing some way. I use water, but you can use something called stop bath and then fixer. So is stop bath necessary? And what is the purpose of stop bath? It's, you know, its purpose is stopping that reaction, you know, uh, you're going from a, a high pH environment to either neutral or, or slightly acidic, and the stop bath is slightly acidic, so it's going to end that reaction faster. But for films, I can't tell you the last time I used a stop bath. Maybe okay. never for film. But paper, you still need it for paper, very much so. So if you're using uh, RC paper, fiber papers, you definitely still need an acidic stop bath. Water stop bath. I've tried it for papers. It did not end well. It was kind of <laughs> messy. It looked like I was doing like lumen printing or something really weird. The developer was all still kind of there and it hits the fix. Basically, you just want to get as much of that developer action stopped because if any active developer 
is still there when the fix hits weird stuff starts happening on your film you can start getting these little little salt and pepper type effects on there it just it, it can ruin your film pretty quickly were you taught at, at uh high school or college like how how are you taught not to use stop when i took uh professor jeff's class his, his was a digital class but when i had darkroom access um he always told us stop just he, cold cold running water stop uh, was plenty, but then when it came to prints, it was all you know. It was stop bath there, so that's how I was taught, and it's kind of how I teach all the black and white classes now. It, it just kind of goes that way. But I've, yeah, I've just not used stop bath for for film ever. Okay, and why is it that some people feel that stop bath is necessary for developing film? Where did that start? The stop. <laughs> Well, it is a convenient product if you don't have running water. So okay. if, if you're schlepping in your own like water, you can probably do the whole process on about a gallon of water start to finish because you can mix up a stop bath. And a lot of those stop baths will be uh, indicating solutions. So they'll, they'll color change when it's, when it's you know used out, you can't use anymore. So you can just leave that and the stop bath will be good until it until it indicates otherwise uh the only downside about that is you got to make sure you you know, you put it back in a bottle or something or it, you know if, if it just evaporates you'll just have all this like yellowish or little yellow crystals or whatever there so right right the crystals <laughs> healing crystals well we need to start wrapping it up because uh we're on a time limit here because we're too poor <laughs> To, uh, we're using oh, Michael. Were you? <laughs> oh, Michael. Oh, Michael. We're we're um, on the uh, Zoom software we're using for this video version of the show. What show? Mm-hmm. Um, and um, we have on a time limit. It keeps things tight, though, right, Matt? It sure does. It's, it's nice, <laughs> it's yeah. like a four-hour show. Yeah, like we usually do. Yeah, exactly. Uh, the Track Man. Oh, it's been a minute since we heard from the Track Man. The Track uh, Man. Hey. What? On YouTube, Scream at the Wall is his YouTube channel. Yeah. And he just started doing pizza reviews. <laughs> okay. Tonight's a special night because tonight they do the Detroit-style slices, which is kind of like a Sicilian, but it's got the sauce on the bottom and the cheese on the top. It's hey. Cheese on the bottom and the sauce on the top. Kind of like a Sicilian, but a little bit hey. different. If you enjoyed the show, this show, what show? What show? Please do send us a note or post a comment. Podcast at filmphotographyproject.com. Badinga. It's been a real pleasure to be here. Uh, and Matt, I'm sure you and I and John will come up with some other topics. Mm-hmm. We did come up with some wacky ideas. Like we could put the word out there that we're doing a conference and up to 100 people can conference in. Oh, oh God. <laughs> Matt, wouldn't that be strange that would be really cool if we could get everybody to uh do the sound effects live in person like at the same time so like everybody e6 on three one two three e6 <laughs> that would be fun be good uh matt uh zoom is ending our meeting oh, okay and uh i'm gonna end the meeting and i will talk, talk to you super, super soon. soon great this was fun guys thank you so much thanks matt i'll talk to you soon Bye. Just kicked us off. I forget what the name of it is. You know I'll what it, it is. Out. You got the music secure? Uh, all right. I guess that went okay. <laughs> <laughs>